pointing towards an, an actual discussion. So it's not, you know, if you're talking about trees, for example, it's not every every time the tree, the word tree is mentioned. That's what you're going to get in keyword search. But in an index, you're, you're, you're going to get pointed to, towards actual discussions about trees. And if there's a lot of them that hopefully broken down in, into subheadings, which will make it even e easier to, to search. You know, the indexer is kind of doing all that searching for the reader and kind of condensing it into a, a you know, a format and a group of entries that's much more usable for the reader. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 330 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have an interview with Stephen Alstrom. Now, Stephen Alstrom is an award-winning professional indexer. He believes that the world is a better place with well-written indexes, and he's passionate about helping authors, publishers, and the index curious understand how indexing works. Stephen has recently released a new book, Book Indexing, a step-by-step -step guide, and you might be surprised to learn that indexing can be useful even for fiction titles. Now that conversation about indexing is coming up later in this episode. First, let's hear a word about this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by the patrons of the Stark Reflections podcast, those folks who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash Stark Reflections, where you get access to additional content and sometimes special surprises. I am looking for improving the cool things that I'm offering to the Patreon community. So I'm going to be sending my awesome patrons a survey so you guys can uh, let me know what you'd like to see more of. But uh, speaking of more of, I just a few days ago released uh, another episode for patrons only. Uh, and it's one of my special reflections on other podcast episodes. They're shorter, but we have 15, 20 minutes. And in this particular one that I shared this week, it was uh, from a clip uh, from the Big Story podcast, which is a Canadian podcast. And there was a really great episode uh, that Liz had told me about, which was a story on the business of book blurbs. And so I shared some clips from that episode, as well as my own reflections, as well as my own personal experience engaged in book blurbs as an author who has received them and given them as well. And again, that is a special episode for patrons with a huge thank you to everyone who supports this podcast over at patreon.com slash Stark Reflections. Really appreciate that. And for those listeners who are not patrons, you can still support the podcast by leaving a review on the podcatcher of your choice. That is very much appreciated. Or um, sharing an episode with someone that you think might find value in the podcast. So thank you to my patrons, awesome patrons, and thank you to all my listeners. Love engaging with you, love hearing your own reflections, and of course, Love being able to give you guys uh, some of that extra stuff every once in a while. Speaking of extra stuff, there's probably going to be some extra episodes between Fridays because I realize I have about 12 interviews in the queue already and more coming up. And I'm so excited to get them to you. I don't want to have to wait 12 weeks to get all of them to you because I know that in those weeks I'm going to be interviewing more awesome guests. But that's... um. This is just kind of a, a, a rambling within the ad read for the patrons, for the sponsor, for the whatever this is. Oh, you can tell I'm not going on a script, can you? Oh, boy. All right. But again, a huge thank you to all my patrons. And let's cue the bumpers so I can get into my personal update. My personal update is not going to be about my writing, but it is going to sound very much like a story that may, may provide you with some interesting 
prompts for your own writing. So, so the title for this unscripted recollection of something that happened to me this week, and this is the week of uh, Friday, October 27, 2023, is Yoik's Foiled by a Skeleton. And so the story, dear listener, begins when I got up in the morning, as I do, I usually get up uh, between 5.30, 5.40 in the morning, I feed the cats, I feed the dog, I put on the coffee, I, I take my blood pressure medication, I prepare um, to warming up the water that's going to be Liz's coffee that she usually for 6.30ish, maybe quarter to 7. And um, as I'm getting ready in the morning, going through the regular morning routine, uh, part of the morning routine, you know, completely clear with the years, I, I take my blood pressure every morning, I, I check my blood pressure, I record it, I record the steps I took the day before, um, if I had anything to drink the night before, how many hours I slept, etc. So, you know, again, I, I take my blood pressure and my health very seriously, and I want to make sure it's like, oh, I didn't get enough steps in, and so that's a, a cue or reminder to, to try and do better uh, that day, and then I can just see the effect at the sleep, and if I had something to drink, uh, may have had on my blood pressure. But, that very morning, before I took my blood pressure, something caused my blood pressure to elevate. And that was, my phone uh, gave me uh, a warning. Um, we have uh, a Nest doorbell cam and, a, and another camera mounted uh, above the garage door, uh, hooked up to our Google Home. And I got a, a notification that there was um, activity or there was a person spotted uh, with the garage camera. And now that's not a big deal because especially this time of year, Liz and I put a lot of care into a lot of care and energy and time and effort into creating a Halloween front yard. And we have uh, lots of skeletons and, and decorations. This year's theme is uh, carnival. Uh, we just recently decided, just last night, uh, decided we're going to call it um, <laughs> Boney Island, uh, as in Coney Island, and, and you know, with a, a look like the classic Coney Island um, sign. And and so sometimes you know, people walking their dogs want to get a closer look, so they walk up the driveway so they can see the the decorations in the front yard. But so I thought that's all it was. But I, I'm a curious kind of guy, you know, writer that I am. So I usually uh, just take a peek just to see uh, who it might be. So I open up the phone and I see a stranger, um, actually dressed all in, in light, light clothing um, with a hat, can't see his face, walking around the front um, of Liz's car, um, between Liz's car and the garage, and then walking towards my car. And I'm thinking, oh, uh, one of those car thief people who try the doors and make sure that they're, you know, you know, see if they're unlocked or whatever. And, and so, you know, I, I, I jump up, I, I, I head downstairs, uh, I run downstairs, uh, run, I, I moved quickly downstairs, but run sounds better, doesn't it? <laughs> so, uh, I flip on the, 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 the light, the big light, uh, for the front yard. Uh, and then I, of course, in my barefoot, I, I, I head out just to see what's going on. There's no one there. I, I, I'm just a few minutes behind, probably uh, three, four minutes after is when I got the no or noticed the notification on my phone anyways. And so I look and everything seems fine. And I check the car doors and they're, they're all still locked. There's no smashed windows or whatever. So I go back inside. And then as I'm going inside and grabbing the coffee that's now done, I look at my phone and, and I review the video and I see... He leaves, uh, a couple seconds after going behind my car, he leaves and goes around the front door towards the front door, around the garage, uh, side of the garage to the front door. And then, this was weird, because that camera, the, 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 the doorbell camera, did not pick him up at all, and it picks up everything. Then, the garage camera again, uh, a couple seconds later, picks him coming back around the corner. He stops. He looks at the one skeleton that we just hung up on the side of the house. It's going to be the concession lady skeleton. So it was a skeleton with a clown mask and clown wig hanging uh, right along the uh, front door, like standing, as, as, if, as if he's standing. And that was going to be the, the concession person selling popcorn and hot dogs and stuff like that. And he looks at it. Then he comes over closer he reaches up, he lifts the skeleton off the hook, and then he walks away with it. And then I can also see in the video, uh, there's um, a car on the street, a black sedan uh, parked on the street. Can't really make out much about it, that just that it's a black sedan. 
So then I go back out again and I go, oh yeah, that's right. The skeleton's gone. And then I realize what the heck was he up to? And I go and I go around the back of my car, which is tucked up really close to the garage, uh, maybe less than a foot close to the garage. And I see that my back license plate is missing. So, ah, license plate thief stole the skeleton, whatever. By that time, I think Liz has heard me coming in and out of the house multiple times. <laughs> I explained to her what I saw. She checks the video and I'm like, yeah. And she goes, you know, how do you know he got the license plate? Because then I looked on, on the computer on the big screen and you can see when he walks, you can see he had a screwdriver in his hand. You look at the, the larger screen, you can see that. And then when you're walking away, you can see that his license plate or, or my license plate is tucked into the back of his pants and you can actually see the rectangular outline of it in, in a screenshot that I took. So anyways, I, I take some screenshots. I end up uh, phoning uh, the police uh, to report it. I, I went online, the Waterloo police have an online form. They said, if you have photos or video, um, call us. So I called in, I explained what happened and I, uh, I give all the details. They give me a report number. And then they say someone will call back um, in a bit, probably an hour or so, follow up. And so I continue to scan the video and stuff like that. So I, I edit the three cl video clips together, you know, put the timestamps on them, and I post them to uh, Nextdoor, it's a, a neighborhood uh, app, just to warn people, thieves in the neighborhood, does anyone recognize this loser? And I also posted to Facebook and I shared it to Twitter and I, and of course, tagged the local news <laughs> as well, uh, just because I wanted to get the video of this guy out there. And, and then I got a call um, a little bit later from uh, another constable who uh, had the, the foreman said, yeah, there was another, um, another license plate theft in your neighborhood and they had your car plates on their car. So they'd switched and put my car on someone else's car and then took the plate. So it's just this multi-layer uh, car um, plate th th thievery that's happening. And, and, and what, the, what the officer on the phone explained to me is that this is very common because most people never look at their license plate. They never check to see it's the same or the correct license plate. So normally uh, they can switch plates and it can be weeks or months before people even notice. And so the stolen car they have has plates not just once removed, but twice or three times or maybe four times removed from the actual stolen car. And because of the layers of deception involved in the stolen plates, you've got like this weird mixture and, and half the time people neglect or don't even notice. So anyways, um, she said, you may want to go to the MTO. Uh, the gentleman was just in here with reported uh, whatever. And we didn't realize until after, I mean, the person who took his complaint didn't make the connection because while he was filing his complaint, I was filing my complaint. And, and, they, and they missed the fact that that was the, the plate he had. My plate was a different report. So she said, you know, if, if you head to the MTO, he's heading there. Maybe you'll see him. Maybe you'll be able to get your plate from the MTO for those outside of Ontario is the Ministry of Transportation Ontario. They have service kiosks for health cards and, and uh, li driver's licenses and, and all kinds of other stuff like that for Ontario law. And so I head down there and I get to the MTO, which is just, you know, a few kilometers away. And uh, I see a, a guy outside, um, Chevy Malibu, um, and, I, and I own a Chevy Impala, a 2010 Impala is what I have. And I see him there, and, and he's putting plates on his car. And so I stopped on my way in, because there's, there's a lineup to get into the MTO anyways. And I say, excuse me, did you did you have your plates stolen this morning? He goes, yeah, yeah, I just got my plates stolen this morning. I just, just got them replaced. I had to pay $59. And, and I'm, I'm chatting with him. Me too. I, I live up and I give him the name of the street and I told him where, where I live. And he goes, oh, and he says, well, I live here. And it's just like just a couple blocks away. And and then I noticed that one of the plates on top of the car is my Stark 001 uh, license plate. And I said, oh my God, that's my plate. They they He said, yeah, that was on my car. So they stole my plate, put it on his car, stole his plates, etc. I later learned that they stole other plates in the neighborhood too. And, and the ruse, again, I learned from the police, is they'll put they'll put two different stolen plates on the car. So there's a, one in the front, one in the back, and it's very confusing. Most people never notice that either. And it's one of the ruses that they use. So 
I get the email uh, address from this guy and I say, oh, I'll send you the video. Like if you have video or whatever, you know, I already sent it to the police. It, maybe your neighbor's caught whatever I explained. It was a black sedan that I could see in the video, whatever I send it to him just so we can spread the word and, and, and maybe catch these guys. So I, of course, you know, uh, share my story on Facebook. Lots of people, <laughs> you know, kind of commenting, et cetera, et cetera. And um, just as Liz is getting home from work, and I'm catching her up on on the things that had happened that day, and you know the, my interactions with MTO, etc. I get a phone call from the Waterloo Regional Police, and it's a different uh, police officer or constable who called to update me and said, "We have recovered your skeleton." Oh, um, I also I should say I, I went to the North Division of Waterloo um, a Police Department, and uh, just to let them know I got I got the plate back in case they needed to know that. And then I also um, uh, showed uh, showed her a picture of the skeleton just in case that's useful for them. And so she I, I gave me the email and I emailed it to her so they had a copy of the skeleton. Anyway, so at the end of the day, I get a phone call. Your skeleton has been recovered. And uh, I was like, wow, that's great. She said, will, will you be around tomorrow? We have to drop off license plates to some of your neighbors. <laughs> we'll be coming by tomorrow. Are you going to be around? Uh, can we call you? And I said, yeah, yeah, you know, I work from home. No problem. So... So this morning, and, and, I'm, and I'm recording this on October 26, 2023. So this morning I get the phone call and they say, yeah, well, we're in, coming close to your neighborhood. We'll be there in about 15 minutes. And so they come, they deliver my skeleton. Uh, I mean, it's, it's missing the clown wig, but it still has the clown mask with it. And the skeleton's in this evidence bag, which I don't want to take it out of the evidence bag. It's so cool to have this evidence bag. It's just bagged up like a dead body in pieces and stuff like that. So anyways... Um, I learned that they captured the the guy, the, the guys. Uh, so the guy that I caught on video and then um, his accomplice. And I had indicated, you know, when I looked at the video, I said, it looks like he has either, you know, he's bald or really, really close cut hair. You can see under the ball cap. And then you could see what looked like either a scar or a vertical black tattoo to the right of his eyes, which what I thought I saw. And lo and behold, yes, he was known to police... Uh, police officers recognized him from the video because this was a similar looking suspect who has been caught in other pictures uh, as as a break and enter person who had uh, broken into homes, stolen credit cards, as well as uh, car thefts and stuff like that. So he was known to police, so they recognized him. And I, I was pretty proud of myself that I picked up on that detail of the tattoo on the side of his face and, you know, the facial hair and all that stuff. So anyways, because uh, again, it's uh, infrared, you know, a black and white camera kind of thing. So it's not you know, not super high quality. You have to really zoom in to see uh, to see what's going on. Anyways, he was responsible for at least two other license plate thefts from our neighborhood. He was specifically picking uh, certain models of Chevrolet that look the same because I guess the plates and the car match, etc. It just makes it a little bit less uh, less indistinguishable. But a couple a couple factors. So. I forgot to mention the gentleman I saw at the MTO. The only reason he knew that uh, were, that weren't his plates when he was going to drive his seven-year-old to school in the morning, he, uh, the seven-year-old walked around the car and said, Dad, you have new, uh, new plates. Uh, and, and that's because, he probably wouldn't have noticed, but because it was my vanity plate, which is very distinguishable than a random set of letters and numbers. So uh, son recognized that. He reported it. I reported, sent the video into the police. And lo and behold, the two suspects were found on Wednesday, on the 25th, uh, passed out in the car in the middle of the day. It was suspicious because they had two different plates on the car, a different one on the front and a different back. I guess the uh, plates matched because because it was reported stolen. They, they, they picked that up. And then... The, the clincher was that there was a skeleton in the car with them. That was my skeleton that was in the car with them. So uh, interesting fact is, um, you know, sharp-eyed uh, citizens and a video, etc. And, and of course, a skeleton led to the arrest. Uh, there were 15 charges of different violations of different property theft and mischief and blah, 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 and car theft and all the different things that they had gotten into. I'm assuming there was some sort of substance that they had, <laughs> illegal substance that was probably on them in the, in the vehicle as well. Who knows what else? But in any case, 
I just thought it was such a fascinating interaction. I know I've, I've had stuff stolen from me before. I've had people break into my car and steal stuff before. I've had property stolen. I've had people do damage to uh, decorations and stuff like that before. And I know that 99% of the time or 90% of the time, these the, the demeanors like this, they, they don't get caught. They get away with it. And so it felt really satisfying that these guys who made victims of many people uh, were caught. And so that, that makes me feel good, of course. But it's also, it's kind of fun because, you know, my skeleton was involved in that. And, and there were jokes uh, that, that the police officer was saying because, you know, uh, who who gets to bring the skeleton back <laughs> as opposed to just delivering license plates to some of the other other folks. Anyways, we had a really good conversation. Uh, everyone that I worked with at Waterloo, um, the police services were just fantastic. They were wonderful. They were patient with me. They were kind. Uh, they were generous because, you know, I was like, hey, I'm a writer. I want to know more. And so I was asking lots of probing questions and stuff like that. But anyway, so that was just an interesting uh, an interesting story that started off with me with high blood pressure because uh, because of what I had witnessed and really upset, of course, because I did yesterday, uh, there was an extra camera I never bothered to install because I'm like, well, what do I need it for? But because that the um, because the doorbell camera didn't even pick up anything, I'm like, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna charge and, and set up my other camera from another angle. So I have two different angles or three now different angles of of that area that it's a, a broader area now that's covered. Um, just in case, I, I want to be able to make sure that if somebody's up to no good, I want to be able to catch them in the act. Um, anyways, so uh, anyways, that uh, that's my very long personal update, but I thought it was an intriguing story. And you can bet, bye, Bob. <laughs> that's, uh, I'm probably going to include some sort of uh, something in one of my books uh, related to this kind of a manipulation of license plates, which I think is fascinating, uh, in the way that they steal cars and they and they mask it and hide it. It makes it makes a lot of sense when you think about it. But of course, how a skeleton could possibly foil a thief? And and let's be honest here, had the crook not stopped to steal the skeleton, had he not been tempted by stealing the skeleton, I may not have even noticed that my license plate was missing. I may not have looked twice if I hadn't seen him stop to check out the skeleton and steal the skeleton. So again, uh, skeletons for the win. And that is it for my personal update. And uh, let's get in to the interview with Stephen about indexing. Because again, when you think about this story I just told you, how would you index the story that I just shared? You'll learn about that and more in this conversation with Stephen. Stephen, welcome to the Stark Reflections podcast. Yeah, thank you very much. Very happy to be here. So before we get into the topic at hand, uh, let's get into you, uh, your background as a writer. Well, as a writer, yeah, it's been a bit of a, a twisty course, I guess. I, I kind of always wanted to be a writer, and I did uh, do part of my undergrad at uh, UBC was in creative writing. I uh, did a, a double major in creative writing and political science. But then, yeah, I guess the the practicalities of, of getting a job and so on <laughs> and, <laughs> intervened a bit. So at UBC, I, I joined the uh, arts co-op program, which kind of gets you work placements. So I got a job with uh, UBC Press uh, for four months. And that's kind of where I first learned about indexing, where I was proofreading indexes. And then I worked for about a year and a half at Harbor Publishing, which is a trade publisher oh, wow. on the West Coast. So um, after I, I left Harbor uh, to move back to Vancouver, I decided to start freelancing. Okay. And so I've been kind of in indexing since then. And I've been, you know, writing a bit along the way. And kind of the original idea was to kind of support my writing with freelancing. But I guess the, the freelancing kind of took over. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, you know, the, the dream is still to write. Um, so with this book uh, on, on indexing that I've written, that was kind of, I, I decided I, I wanted to write something that I could actually finish. And, and and see to to completion, and I, I'm still interested in in fiction, but I was just having, I guess, more more trouble putting together my my fiction ideas. So you know, nonfiction on something I knew felt like a easier project to see to completion. So so that's where I'm at. And uh, now now that book's out, I'm I'm turning back towards fiction and and hope to just make make some more progress in that 
regard well, I, to it makes sense right when you think about it because you have so much work experience life experience in this so you're just taking all of mm -hmm. that expertise and putting it on the page for someone else to benefit from so that makes it a little bit yeah easier. so i have yeah, to ask right. then, when it comes to fiction when you yes. do your <laughs> fiction what yeah. uh, uh were the particular genres that you lean towards yeah, uh, it's, uh, both kind of science fiction and and and, and mysteries are kind of where I'm I'm, I'm turning okay. into uh, words. I, I have man. ideas in both worlds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. Cool. So, awesome. Well, we'll look forward to that. So, so uh, okay, you uh, alluded to the book. Let's talk about what what is the book and when did when did you uh, release this? Yeah. So the book is uh, book indexing, a step by step guide. So got a copy here. So. Yeah, it's basically, as it says, it's kind of in, intended for, for authors uh, who are interested in writing their own indexes or for you know, editors who are interested in perhaps moving into indexing or, you know, other uh, new indexers. Um, and, it, you know, my goal was basically just to kind of make indexing really simple, simple and, and, and kind of practical and accessible. Right. So, um, so, so that's, yeah, that's actually the, the goal of the book. Um, you know, you know, there are other uh, some, some some other books on in indexing out there that are also ex excellent, but in my opinion, they're kind of more aimed at professional in, 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 in indexers who already have you know some experience. So um, this book, I, I was trying for something that was more entry level. I, I, I guess something that was more someone like me, kind of quick, quick quicker to read. Yeah, yeah, someone who knows nothing index. about indexing. Yeah, that, okay, wow, that's right. Yeah, That's because right. actually yeah. Uh, a good friend of mine, ML Bachman, uh, his mm -hmm. wife uh, is a professional indexer, right? So as you know, oh, really? there are there are professional oh. indexers who... Yeah, that's right. And, and, and I was like, that's cool, <laughs> but it just <laughs> sounds hard. So, but I'm glad you're here because you're going to break it down because there's a book, it's available. It's not a, yeah. a textbook price. It's a reasonable price that the average mm. author can afford. And yes. yeah. But also, you're going to break down a little bit about indexing. Uh, so, so let's let's get started. Mm -hmm, I want to I want to sure. dig into this. And and sorry, when did yeah. the book first come out? Uh, the book was was released uh, July 11th. So it's been eight weeks, I guess. All right. Out. Yeah. And this yeah. is uh, 2023 for anyone listening to this in the future. Yeah, 2023. <laughs> July <laughs> 2023. All right. So, so Stephen, let's let's get down to the core core raw question here: Is mm -hmm. why should an author even care about indexing? Mm hmm. Yeah, no, it's a good question. <laughs> well, it's uh, I think it's it's ultimately about serving your your readers. Um, so that's kind of the the, the real core of it. Right. Um, I think part of it is that you know some readers uh, expect an index or or want to index, and I, I I know when I often tell people that I'm in, an indexer, one one of the responses I often get is that they'll tell me that you know, when they're looking to buy a book, they, they first look to see if it has an index. And if it doesn't have an index, they're less inclined to buy it. Um, really? Uh, the, the well, most likely, probably for nonfiction titles, right? Or Yes. Well, this is for, for, <laughs> for nonfiction, yes. But we'll, 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 we'll just clarify that. Gosh darn that Margaret Atwood, she never indexes her novels. <laughs> so. That's right. <laughs> but, but they're good. <laughs> we can talk about that later. But, um, yeah, so what is that readers, uh, some, some readers expect it and want it. Um, okay. Another thing I've heard, and this is something I, I've heard from from one of my, my publishing clients, is kind of the index as 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 a, as a marketing tool, in that it can be something that you can put out, like say on Amazon in the you know look inside feature, um, and people can can see the index and see what's in the book before they buy it. Okay. Um, and with this one client, you know, uh, when when they kind of told me this, uh, I was indexing a health book, and they wanted me to index every single kind of disease or symptom that appeared in the book. Cause they were like, you know, we want readers, potential readers to be able to find their own disease or symptom in the book. Yeah. And then maybe in the index, and then maybe they'll be more inclined to, to buy the book to see how they can help themselves kind of thing. Right. Right. right? So yeah, so, so that's another reason. And then, you know, basically I think having an index just kind of adds value to the book. It's something more that you can give the reader. Right. And this is especially true. I mean, if, for a nonfiction book, if, if you want the book to serve as a reference or something that readers are going to come back to late, later to look for information, because it just makes it easier for readers to to find what they're looking for. Wow. Right. Um, I, I actually, you know what? I, I I've never even thought about this before, but it is something I do. Mm -hmm. I, I write a lot of true ghost stories or tales right. told as true as John Robert Colombo taught me. Right. Yeah. And. And and I buy a lot of books about haunted locations and stuff like that. And oftentimes, mm -hmm. 
Um, it may be a theme of uh, whatever. I, maybe I'm looking for haunted hospitals, but this is haunted Ontario. And I'm like, why well, are there any hospitals in the haunted Ontario book? Are there any hospitals in the haunted BC mm -hmm. book or whatever? And, right. and an index yeah. would make it so much easier because I could go to the back and go do, 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 like hospitals, bing, bing, bing. And I yeah. see the pages like, oh, there's 16 entries buying this book immediately. And so, yeah, so I right. have to stand there and flip yeah. through the book and go, oh, is this do I? And I end up obviously buying a, a lot of books. Uh, or even mm -hmm. checking out from the library a lot of books because there is no index and and then i have right. to kind of skim through the whole book and and yeah. indexes yeah. oh my goodness could save me hours and hours and hours of research time uh so yeah wow yeah, i never sure. thought of that yeah. how come how come you didn't just come walk up and smack me in the head and say mark indexes dude <laughs> <laughs> okay sorry I, i'm just i'm seeing uh, the light here and not and not just yeah, the light good. behind you on the on the ceiling <laughs> right <laughs> I could think that. Anyway. Oh, oh, there, there. I'm uh, seeing that. I'm seeing double light now. Okay. <laughs> uh, visual humor for anyone watching this uh, on YouTube. Sorry, audio people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I, yeah, I, I sorry. sidetracked us. Oh, okay, so, oh, no, so you talk about the value um, uh, for an mm -hmm. author or value for the book itself because you can kind of, and, and, yeah. and I just came to the realization the startling realization oh my god yeah it makes it so much easier for for people buying books for research and wanting to refer to things but mm -hmm. yeah. uh it's it's more than just keywords right it's more than just that searchability mm -hmm. on, on amazon and other sites can you talk a little bit about that um yeah in terms of like like what kind of things go in the in the index yeah yeah i guess um, uh, i mean well how does it differ yeah. you've got the table of contents you've got maybe an extended table of contents where you can mm, kind of right and, go, and then the keyword and then, searches yeah so the, yeah the index yeah does what? So, yeah that's right so there are different ways that you can search a book right um yeah you know some some books have an extended table of contents where you not just have the chapter titles but you also have the the, the section titles and then you know with ebooks of course or pdfs you have keywords you can do a keyword search yeah, no, that's a good question. And that's something I, I often get to questions from people. And, and I think publishers kind of make this assumption too about keyword search. But I, yeah, I think uh, maybe start with keyword search. I, you know, I think the, the difference there really is that with keyword search, it, it's unfiltered. So, you know, you type in a word and you're going to get every mention of that word, right? And it could be five mentions, it could be 500. Right, right. Right. Um, Whereas with the index, you know, a good index, I, I do, the indexer has gone through and done kind of done all that filtering for you, um, and it's kind of weeded out all all the irrelevant kits and just kind of pre pre presenting what what what's relevant. Oh, like not just a um, reference, but something that's actually concrete, then, right? Yeah, so yeah. So you know, it's pointing towards an, an actual discussion. So it's not, you know, if you're talking about trees, for example, it's not every every time the tree the word tree is mentioned, <laughs> you know. That's what you're going to get in keyword search, but in the index, you're 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 going to get pointed to towards actual discussions about trees, right. and if there's a lot of them that hopefully broken down in, into subheadings, which will make it even e easier to to search. Wow. Right, and you know another difference there is that with keyword search, you're only going to find um, the exact matches, um, so it's not going to find you know misspellings or you know different forms of the word. Right. Um, like, like conjugations or, you know, with people, especially, you know, people can refer to by their first name or their last name or by pronouns or, or, or whatever, right? So the indexer ideally should be, you know, when they're reading the book, they should be able to kind of see that these things are, these similar terms are actually the same thing and then put them all, all together in, in, in the index. Right, right. Yeah. So the indexer is kind of, you know, the indexer is kind of doing all that searching for the reader and kind of condensing it into a, a you know, a format and a group of entries that's much more us usable right. for, for the reader. And then with the table of contents, the difference there is, you know, an extended, extended table of contents is good. I, I have one in, in, in my own book, actually, um, so that a, a beta reader asked for it. But it's still, it's, it's, it's a much more of a big picture view of, of the book. And so, you know, it is helpful. It does have its place, I, I think, but the index can get much more granular. Because, you know, in the table of contents, you're not going to pick up the smaller details or examples that you use, you know, within the chapters or or or, or, or within the sections right. that readers may 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 still want to uh, find. You, you, you know, um, you know, like if you make some 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 reference to to some movie or something like like, like that, that's a great illustration of what you're talking about. You know, that's something that you know is probably going to stick in in the reader's mind, and they may want to go back and and, and find that. But right. you're not going to find that in the table of contents. 
Okay. Right. Yeah, of course. So, yeah. Because it's an element yeah. within discussion in a chapter. I mean, it almost feels mm -hmm. like the indexer is like an intern you didn't have to pay for. I mean, as the reader, right. you know, obviously the publisher had to pay for it. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Wow, I love that. Okay, wow. Okay, yeah. so um, yeah. so you talked about um, it's you included in ebooks then as well. It's not just right. something, yep. a print book that you flip to the back. So the, the, right. there's some sort of so how does it work in ebooks? Is it just with hot link, like not links within uh, the book itself? Yeah, basically, yeah. So so my ebook version um, has a link index, so it's essentially the same index as in the print book, and it still has all the page numbers there. But you know the page numbers, of course, they're they're kind of meaningless. You know, it it it, yeah. it, it evokes, but but they but they are linked back to to that location in the text. Oh, no. So you so can, if it you was can click those the references. There would be reference one, reference two, reference three, as opposed to page number or whatever, right? Um, no, the the ebook version, at least the way I did it for mine, it it still shows the page number. So it still shows that the page number is you know fifty two. Right. And that would be example. the page number because. Yes, and that's the, the the print page number. Okay. So you would click the fifty two, and it would take you, you know, to that section. Yeah. In 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 the book. Um. So well, it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, uh, it's not too complicated. Um, I I, I think cre creating an index for an ebook is a bit more complicated, because what you need to do essentially is to embed. It, Use this process called, um, or create what's called an an embedded in index, um, in which you are embedding tag, uh, tags within the, the text, okay. and then the, the, these tags create the the links, help help create the, the links. Okay. So an embedded index, you know, you can use the same index for both the print book and and the ebook, because um, it just kind of generates the index based on on, on these tags, and then you can use it however you want. So it's quite versatile in that sense. But it is kind of more kind of tricky to figure out the whole embedding process. That's kind of an, an additional step to creating the index. Wow. So that's kind of the downside of, of doing the embedded in, 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 in indexing route. So that yeah. makes me want to dig into the process. But before we get there, I did joke earlier. I joked a mm -hmm. little bit about fiction and indexes. But are there cases, mm -hmm. are there cases where uh, a fiction author may want to use an index in a, in a, in a novel? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, yeah, and I mean, personally, I, I think that, you know, a, a lot of really long series could could use a really good index. Um, and, and one of my favorite examples here, which I discussed it in, in the book, is um, a website, kind of a, a, a fan website for the Wheel of, of Time series called Encyclopedia WOT, or, you know, Wheel of, Wheel of Time. Yeah. And what they've done to me, it essentially, essentially looks like an in index in which you can search for people, places, wherever, and it tells you where in the series these these appear every uh, uh, appearance okay. by by book and chapter, and and so you, you know I think that's a great example of you know if if you have a favorite character but you can't remember if they appear in book five or book seven or you know you, you know they're one of the middle books but you can't remember where exactly right, right. right. yeah and you, they're you, not you know, small you books either them. so. <laughs> no, that's right. I guess the Dune, uh, Dune novels too, right? Considering uh, the worlds, the characters, the the vast, the vast. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, that's right. The Dune books, um, or uh, yeah, I mean Brandon Sanderson's books. I mean all of his books. Uh, yeah, but you know another way that fiction can be indexed is you know for for research. I, I guess you know this is more perhaps classic books. And, and one of my favorite examples there is a book. It was a, a, a German a German novel published, I think, in the 1920s or 30s, called uh, The Life of, of My Mother by Oscar Maria Graf. But for that, because he he, he wrote, his style was done, he wrote in a very re realistic style. So it's all um, kind of about, I think it was like, like Bavarian pe peasant life at that time. Right. right. So this book now can be used as like, you know, as, as, as a primary document for his, his historical re research. So, you know, there's been indexes written for, for that book, just picking up details about their clothing and their religious life and their, you know, you know farming and wow. just all kinds of things. So that's probably not too applicable for, for most, you know, people, you know, publishing their, their, their novels uh, today. But wow. I think that's still just a really cool application. I think this speaks to that you can index pretty much anything or you can put almost anything in, in an index, right? It just depends on, you know, is there an audience? 
for that information and and do they want to to find this 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 in, in, in information wow um all right so, so I, I guess the question uh, that beg's asking and, and and obviously you published a book so i think the answer is pretty obvious i hope it's obvious mm-hmm. anyways or at least i've intuited it without <laughs> looking at the index but um is this right. can this be DIY or is it something where you always need a professional to do it for you? And 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 where do you make that distinction? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's a good question. I think it definitely can be DIY, and I did kind of write my my book in part for for authors who want to do it themselves, but who just you know don't know how or or or, or want some help. So you know, it's not magic. You know, I think it is a skill that that, that can be taught. So yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of different considerations. You know, what, when is uh, time, you know, do you have time to do it? Because it, it, it can be, you know, quite a lengthy process. I, I mean, for myself, if I'm indexing a 200-page book, you know, that would probably take me about 20 hours, you know, on, 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 on average. Wow. Um, and, you know, for someone doing it themselves for the first time, it's probably going to take, you know, longer, right? Because um, it's a new skill that, that, that you're doing. So, you know, you have to make sure that you have the time that you can put into it. And if you don't have the time, then that's maybe where you want to hire a, a professional. You're kind of paying for their time to do it. You know, uh, another consideration is this, you know, your in interest, right? You know, does this, you know, it, it is kind of very detailed oriented work and for work that requires a lot of careful thought and organization and so on. So if that's the kind of thing that gets you excited that, you know, this might be a good fit for you. And if it sounds like the most boring is, you know, drudgery in the world, <laughs> maybe it's not the right thing for you. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Then, you know, I think budget is also a consideration because, you know, hiring a professional uh, can get quite expensive. Um, you know, it, it, it is possible to kind of shop around and, you know, to find someone that might be willing to work within your your budget. Wow. Um, that That's perfectly fair. But, you know, it, it is going to cost something. Right. So, whereas if you do it yourself, then, then obviously you're not spending the money, but then you're also choosing to spend. The, the time to do it right so, you're you're, yeah. you're a professional and you said a 200 mm-hmm. page book would take you about 20 hours so that's about an hour per 10 pages but that's because you've done this before i would suspect it's going to take mm-hmm. twice as long or more for someone who doesn't know what they're doing right yeah that's right yeah yeah i mean certainly when i was first started out i was i was much slower and uh yeah, I mean, I guess it depends a bit on, on your book too, right? If, if if your book is quite short, you know, 100 pages or 150 pages, then it's not right. going to take as long. If you're publishing like a, a 400 page book or a 600 page book, which I've, I've been textbooks that long, you know, with that obviously going to take yeah. you know, significantly longer. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> like, uh, you know, um, a chapter of a Brandon Sanderson novel. But um, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so I guess I wanted to contrast the time spent potentially mm-hmm. 40 hours for a 200 page book for the beginner mm-hmm. right with what it would cost okay so that's a full week now what yeah. would it what would it cost a professional uh to hire to do a 200 page book i mean and there's probably a price mm-hmm. range right there's like a low ball and then the mid range and a high end yeah for sure yeah you know different indexers set, set their own prices so uh you can you can shop around um you could also perhaps negotiate a bit with the indexer as to how how thorough the index will be, you know, perhaps they'd be willing to take a, a lower price for less thorough. Right, right. In, 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 in index, so you can, you know, discuss those kind of things. But I mean, yeah, speaking for myself, I'm thinking here in Canadian dollars, because that's what uh-huh. I usually work in. But, you know, like a 200 page uh, trade book. So for trade books, I, I often usually charge, um, say, about $4 per page or four fifty dollars per, per page. Okay. So for, that would be, Perhaps uh, you know eight to nine hundred dollars um, for a, for a trade book. This is kind of like a, a general audience, you know, right. memoir or science book or yeah, uh, yeah. Or, or or business book, whatever. Um, and then for like a scholarly book, I'm usually charging now maybe about six or six fifty, or maybe even up to seven dollars per per page. So you know we're looking at you know maybe twelve to fourteen hundred hundred dollars there. Right, right. Yeah, because um, it's a yeah. lot denser. Um, yeah, a lot denser, a lot more going on. And, 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 and that's a market books. that charges a significant amount uh, for their books, too. So <laughs> for it's all part yeah. and parcel, right? <laughs> that's right. And, and, you know, it's often for scholars who are doing research, and then they kind of yeah. a, a appreciate a very detailed 
yeah, in, in, in yeah. index, you know, so, so you kind of need need something. Okay, that's so quite comp comprehensive. Let's 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 dig into this uh, yeah. a little bit. I'm just thinking about for the DIY or just to understand what is mm -hmm. sort of. I mean, and obviously it's a long process, but what's the process roughly that you go through when you're mm -hmm. indexing a book? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so kind of the 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 process, broadly speaking, that I outlined in, 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 in my book, it's kind of a, a, a five-step process. So, um, yeah, I'm able to say all five and then, and then go through it a little more. But um, the, the first step is just kind of getting ready. And then it's to actually read the book uh, and it's to, then to write the rough draft and then to edit the index and then to, to solicit feed, feedback. Um, so yeah, so, so starting with just getting ready. So so th this is things like you know planning your time and kind of you know when are you going to write it. It's also things like you know figuring out how are you going to write the index. Are you going to uh, print the proofs out and mark them up? Are you going to use software or you uh, type everything in the word? It's also things like uh, the formatting. You know, kind of de deciding are you going to what kind of alph alphabetization you're going to do or whether you're going to do run-in format or index format. And some of this, like with format, if you're working with a publisher, the publisher may have their their style guide and preferences. So right. in that case, you would just get that from the publisher and make sure you understand it. But this is this is just kind of making sure that you have everything that, that you need to get started and kind of have, have a plan in place. Yeah. How to go forward. And then yeah, the second step I have is read the text. And I, I know this might seem kind of strange, but one of the probably the, the most common question I get from people is that they ask me, you know, do you actually read the book when 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 you index? Yeah. And you know the answer is well, well, yes, I, I have to, right? Because otherwise, I don't know what what what, what goes in, in in what goes in the index. So, right. so definitely read the book, and I think this is important too if you're indexing your own book, um, just because even if it's your own book and and you you, you know what's in the book, there's there's often you know a, a lot of smaller details that should also be indexed um, that you may not you know re remember or, or remember where where exactly they they are. So I think it's still you know, just just for accuracy's sake, it's, it's still better to to read through the whole book again with indexing in in mind, so you yeah. can you know find find everything. And then you know, there's there's writing the the rough draft, and you know, there's a couple ways you could do this. You know, one way, and if you're new to this, this is what I would recommend, but is to kind of go through the text and kind of mark it up first. So, you know, either printing out the proofs and doing it hard copy or doing it on a PDF, but just kind of going through and just identifying what all the potential entries are. So your underlying your underlining names or certain concepts or whatnot, making notes to yourself of what what we think should go in the index. And I think this can be helpful, especially if, if you're new, is because if you're not quite sure what could go in, in the index, you know, the kind of that first draft, you can just kind of experiment and just kind of you know, make notes, and then as you go through the second pass to actually start typing up the entries in in the index, then you can kind of start revising and kind of rethinking your choices, right? And so you kind of get get a cleaner a draft. Or alternatively, you could do like what I do now is where you just, you just start reading the, the book and start typing up the entries as 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 you go through. So by the time I, I finish reading the book, I, I have a full rough draft. So you have um, the book uh, open on an e-reader or, or on, on the desk in front of you or on a computer screen, and then you have like a uh, separate window open. And and what do you, I mean, I'm just curious, do you use Excel? Do you use some sort of spreadsheet or yeah, is yeah. it that organized or is it just a plain Word document kind of thing? Yeah, no, good, yeah, good, good question. Uh, well, for myself, I, I work all on the computer. So I, I have a, the PDF of, of the book on, on one side of my screen and I, I use a, a, an indexing software called Syndex. Um, and, and Syndex, it basically handles all the formatting for me okay. and it makes it e e easier to edit and to kind of ma manip manipulate the index. Okay. So and it's called so, Syndex. Syndex. Yes. Okay. Uh, C-I-N-D-E-X. Yes. Okay. Index. Not S-I-N. Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's only for writing really, really bad horror novels. Okay. Sorry. That's right. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Uh, okay. Right. So, so that's software that you use yeah. and you've got like split screen and that's how you do uh, the editing. Yeah. Right? Right. That's right. Yeah. So as I'm reading through the book, I'm kind of typing up all the entries in in Syndex. So yeah. So that's you know creating the the, the the rough draft. It's kind of getting all the entries in that you think should should be there. Um, and then you know the next step is to edit the index. Um, so I often like to do this kind of the the next day, just kind of give myself a little space from the rough draft. And this is 
you know, checking things like accuracy, you know, does, do the entries accurately reflect the book and are, are the page numbers accurate and things like clarity, you know, do the main headings and subheadings make sense, in, 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 you know, and, and then also, you know, more nitty gritty stuff like, you know, is the spelling correct and is, is the punctuation correct? Yeah. Right. So, so there's that. And then, yeah, the last step I have here is, is the solicit feedback. And I included that just as a reminder, I guess, that the index is ultimately for, for your readers, right? It, it's not for yourself. So, I, I mean, you, you could index a book for yourself if you wanted to. I, mm -hmm. um, that, that's totally valid. You have like a favorite cookbook that doesn't have a, an, a, an, an index. But, but you know, it, it is ultimately for, for your readers. So, you know, you, you want to make sure that, that the index works for them. So, yeah, so I, would, I mean, if you're working with a publisher, you'd probably send the index to, to your editor. And they might give you feedback, but I think you you can also send it to you know beta readers kind of thing for for the index. Just ask them you know how does this work for you? You know can you find the entries you want? Uh, is there anything missing? Is it hard to use? Is it easy to use? And just get some feedback, and then maybe do some more editing um, after after that. Wow. So um, that's a very quick quick process. No, no, and and I and I appreciate that, be. of course. Um, but but that's but, great. It just gives you an idea yeah. of of what the process is. Obviously, mm -hmm. the book is available, um, and I imagine people can find the book. They can find it online. They find it at most bookstores. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, it's published uh, wide. So yeah, it's available on the online retailers, or or you can also ask your local bookstore to uh, order a, the paper. And what's back. the name of the book again? A book indexing, a step by step guide. Nice and simple book indexing, so, a step by step guide, and I love that that the the cover itself was just very like just clear. This is this is we're not going to mm -hmm. try to confuse you. We're going to try to right. simplify things for you here. Yeah, but was it yeah, published? Yeah. Uh, was it published through a publisher, or was it something that you it did independently? Yeah, so I I, I, I self published it. Okay. Yeah. So so besides you know writing about indexing and teaching indexing, I, I also just wanted to to try self publishing for myself mm -hmm. and cool. and see cool. how that went. Uh, I guess the other question I had is, um, is do you, uh, or do you freelance as an indexer? So if people are listening and they said, yeah, too much work for me, but I'd rather <laughs> hire. Are you available for hire as an indexer? Yeah, for sure. I, I, I work as a full-time freelance in indexer. Yeah, I, I, I will say my, my schedule often fills up a couple months in advance. Right. So if, if you'd like to work with me, I, I, I ideally contact me ahead of time, you know, give me okay. a, of course. at yeah, least a month of notice, but not two months notice. <laughs> but <laughs> otherwise, I, I, I may have to regretfully say no. <laughs> yeah, like I need something next week. Yeah, sorry. I get you. Yeah, I get you. I mean, again, I have to hire narrators uh, for audiobooks, and I'm looking six months mm -hmm. in, the, in the future. And so right, days. right. So I guess the, yeah. the, the sort of the sort of close to the last question is where can people find you online? Um, yeah, probably the best place is my website, which is just uh, stephenolstrom.com. And uh, through there, uh, I, I have a newsletter where I, I you know, regularly write, write about in indexing and, uh, and, what, and what's happening. So that's probably the best place. I am on Twitter. I'm not terribly active right now. Um, I'm starting to get a little more active what it's on, called now. On, on LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I guess it's not Twitter anymore. <laughs> uh, there should be an index that just says, you know, it was, it was called this, now it's called this. Um, next oh, week, it will be something else, right? <laughs> Sorry, just joking. Um, it will be. No, 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 that's totally valid. I, I've done that with Facebook and, and Meta, actually. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In, 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 in index, yeah, the cross references between them. <laughs> uh, oh, think that their name. But, uh, but, but yeah, so probably my, my, my website uh, for the news, newsletter and then occasionally oh. on. Uh, on Twitter and, and uh, LinkedIn awesome. are the best places. All right. And then the final question, I'm saving the hardest for last, of course, just to put you on the okay. spot, is um, yeah. what's what's a common misperception about indexing that you want authors to be aware of? He's like, here's the reality of the situation. Mm. I think perhaps a common misconception is that it's something that's really easy to do. And I guess by easy to do, I mean, that's really, really fast to do. Like you can do it in a weekend or in an afternoon or kind of thing. And I, I don't want to scare people by saying that it's really hard because I, I think it is, it, it is very doable once, you know, you kind of know the process and, and understand what to put in the index and so on. But I think it, it is also something that, that does take some work. It does it take some, some time, you know, like I often think of it 
for myself as like a marathon instead of a sprint. You, you know, when I sit down to start a new index, you know, I, I know that it's going to take me all week to do kind of thing. Right. And that I kind of need to break the work up into chunks and kind of pace myself. Um, and that I will get to the end, but I'm not going to do it all in this one afternoon kind of thing. So I, I think if people have that in mind, have a more realistic expectation for how how long it's going to take and, and, and the work involved, then it can go quite well. But if you go into it thinking that it's just a very easy thing, you can you know, yeah. dash off with your coffee kind of thing, uh, then it, it's not going to go well. So, yeah, kind of, kind of like, yeah, I'll just write yeah. the book. It'll be really fast and easy. Right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, I have to tell you, Stephen, yeah. uh, I'm so intrigued. Yeah. Uh, when we when we finish this call, I'm immediately going and ordering myself a copy because I really want to investigate more. I want to learn more about the process of indexing and then decide for some of my books whether or not mm -hmm. I'm going to invest the time myself or invest the money right. in a professional right. investor. Stephen, yeah. thank you so sure. much. Thank you for hanging out with me today. Yes. Well, thank you. It's been delightful. Thank you. So that was a really fascinating interview for me because I've written a number of books. I've written a number of nonfiction books, you know, uh, true ghost stories. And, and as I mentioned in the interview, I, even though when I'm purchasing books to do research to write these kinds of books, I rely and I, I look for an index because it, it helps me figure out if it's going to be useful for me. So it, it kind of makes me wonder... So for the next books that I do, I know I know Dundurn typically doesn't do indexes, but if I'm doing it with a different publisher or I'm I'm indie publishing it, I'm wondering about the value of adding an index. And 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 then that leads me to think about the nonfiction books for writers that I have created. You know, Wide for the Win, an author's guide to working with bookstores and libraries, Seven P's of Publishing Success, Killing It on Kobo, Accounting for Authors. And, and even, I mean, Joanna Penn and I did The Relaxed Author. And, and so I'm wondering, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I know I'm going to have to do updated versions, like uh, updated version of Wide for the Win. Uh, I'm getting close to a point where I have enough information that it'll be more than 10% and I, uh, for a new edition. But I'm wondering if in the new edition I, I make more revisions and then I also invest in the time and energy to do an index. So, for example, in Wide for the Win, maybe somebody's looking specifically for something about Google Play. Um, or they're looking for a particular um, ream stories or or some other platform, uh, I, which isn't in the original wide for the win. I would be adding that in the next edition. But they could go to the index and quickly look up terms, look up things like you know ads, um, Amazon ads, ads for authors, any of those any of those other uh, sorts of things. Does this talk about Facebook ads? Where and then they can quickly flip to it to see if it has it. So so I think there's some some huge value in there. And 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 I remember like this is a it's a marketing tool, as Stephen said. Like it becomes a marketing tool. So I'm, I'm, I am going to look at next editions of my nonfiction books for writers and see if that is appropriate. But then I was also thinking about some of my fiction, uh, and, and this could be interesting. And so you know, a horror story collection, one hand screaming was a book that I originally published in 2004. That's right, in uh, 2024, it'll be 20 years since I self-published my first book. But let's say someone's wanting uh, wanting to read horror fiction and it's, you know, 20 stories by Mark Leslie. Well, well what, what are in the stories? You know, are there any stories about monsters or Sasquatch? Are there ghost stories, stuff like that? Maybe there can be a very limited <laughs> index to uh, the different, uh, monsters or creatures or themes or, or or whatever that could be an interesting thing but then I think about my uh and again he was talking about Wheel of Time but I think about my Canadian Werewolf series and I'm I'm working on book seven now or I will be in in just a few days I'm going to get started on that again or get back into that and that means there's characters that I refer to that uh, may I may want to bring back or uh, minor characters side characters etc a, a great way to keep track of them somehow maybe and maybe that's just for me maybe that's not something that gets published in a book maybe it's something that gets released only to the fans because they're the only ones who truly care about it so they can argue about stuff <laughs> whatever but I'm, I'm I'm thinking about it so I'm curious, what are you thinking about as a writer? I mean, obviously, if it's nonfiction, it's probably clearer. But if there's fiction of yours, is there some way that you think indexing or, or doing some sort of indexing exercise could be useful for you, either for the book itself as a, you know, at the end of the book, or that could be a value to your 
best fans, your biggest fans. Uh, so that's made me think a lot. And so uh, I've ordered Stephen's book. I haven't yet opened it, but I do look forward to perusing it, checking it out, learning some techniques. I went and looked at the software he talked about, and even the most inexpensive one, except for the student rate, I think it was something like $300, $400. Uh, and so it's like, whoa, whoa, even just buying the software alone is an investment. Uh, whereas, you know, a 200 page book, uh, you know, Stephen would be doing it for anywhere between 800 to a thousand dollars. That's like the software is like half of that price. So and not to mention the time that it would take you to index. So anyways, I'm going to explore the possibility of it. And I would even, I would even be curious to work with someone like Steven for an indexing exercise for something shorter, just to get the feel for how a professional approaches it as well. Anyways, I'm always fascinated by different approaches, new approaches, things that we can learn about tools and techniques and, and great, um, I guess when you think about this, this is sort of a, I think of an indexer as an editorial advantage. It's like an editorial layer that gets added to enhance a book and make it better. What about you? What are your thoughts on indexing? Love to hear, love to hear what you guys are thinking about or reflecting when you listen to the show. Uh, you can leave your comments over at starkreflections.ca and you know on the social medias, etc. etc. But that's it for episode 330. Thank you so much for being with me this week. I will be back again next week. So until next week. And next episode, and it may, may not even be next week, but until the next episode, that I can tell you for sure. This is Mark Leslie LeFave, and here's wishing you great writing, some intriguing indexing, and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com.